I've learned a lot about the potential of Twitter for reaching a broader audience. And we have with us here today um, two experts on that, um, which I will turn it over to to really do the workshop. Um, Kayla Eisenberg is the Senior Digital Engagement Manager for the campus, UCSC. And then we also have Andrea Limas, who's the Assistant Director of Communications and Marketing for the Division of Social Sciences. And with that, again, thank you for joining us and welcome. And I'll turn it over, I think, to Andrea's going first. Okay, so today we are talking about how to use Twitter for social impact. And I wanna give a brief introduction about um, myself and Kayla. Um, we are both marketing experts for the university um, on the central communications and marketing team. Like Chris said, I work um, with the social sciences division as the assistant director of communications and um, Kayla, works for the main UC Santa Cruz accounts. So why should you listen to us today? Um, I am a former social media strategist for the University of San Francisco. And I also have about 10 years of experience managing um, social media platforms for tech, tourism, and wine. And Kayla, she is the voice behind the UC Santa Cruz main brand social media accounts. And she has 15 years of digital marketing and social media experience in music, tech, and higher ed. So what you will learn today on the next slide is um, just a quick overview of Twitter, foundations for success, how to build your community and get your research noticed, how to reach influencers and journalists, and we will also cover social media activism, social media for social good. And then at the end, we will have an Ask Me Anything, and that is Twitter speak for Q&A. So if you have any burning questions left over, you will be able to ask those at the end. And with that, I will pass it off to Kayla. Thank you. Sorry, it's very hard to know when to click when you're not the speaker. So now I have full control. <laughs> Thank you everybody for having me here today. Um, so let's go over just a few things. So in order to start a social media activism movement or share your research, we have to know how to use Twitter. So we're gonna go over just a few things about the platform. So I'm sure you all wanna know the million dollar question. I'm super busy, why should I be on Twitter? Um, so let's go over a few things. So our official inside higher ed says that you should be on Twitter because it allows academics and people in knowledge industries to interact directly. It's the preferred social network of journalists, super important because of its open nature and capacity to cover breaking news. Um, when your area of expertise intersects with a public issue, it's a great place to share your knowledge. And we're gonna go into that uh, a little further into the presentation here. Um, academics know things, as you all know, that the general public does not. So let's share it with the general public. Um, journalists communicate with the public and Twitter is the best place to talk to them. A uh, really nice quote here. Uh, it's my global office hours as Princeton University historian. Um, and then what we say in probably in a different way, I have to close that. Uh, Twitter opens up a whole new world for academics to tout your research. You can join the global conversation, become cited and referenced, and establish yourself as a thought leader in your field, all without leaving your couch or your desk. Uh, Twitter is useful for staying current on trends and developments in your field. Um, there is no other opportunity out there that puts you in front of an audience ready and willing to consume your thoughts and research on a daily basis. Uh, you can join your field's global community with the click of a button. Um, we have another great quote here. We have the responsibility to share our scientific knowledge. So with COVID happening, uh, let's try to share it digitally now. Um, all right, are you convinced? I think you all are. Great, let's go. So we're gonna get started here. Here's just a couple of my own social media rules to live by. There is no viral button. A good social media presence takes time. There's a bit of a misconception that once you join Twitter or any social media platform uh, that you're just gonna take off and you're gonna go viral and all your research is gonna be shared. It does take work and it does take time and we're gonna go into how you do that today. Um, don't overthink it, just jump in and get going. It's really all about measuring your results, seeing what works and seeing what doesn't and uh, refining that over time. Um, you should be where your audience is. 
Twitter is an awesome place for academics and researchers. In fact, this year, Twitter is investing a bunch of money into new tools for academics and researchers uh, to be able to promote their work. I don't know what those are yet, but they do see that uh, academics and sharing research is important on Twitter, so they are investing in that. Um, I always say be great at one to two platforms rather than mediocre at five. Um, but for the purposes of this, Twitter is definitely where you guys should be. Um, Lurk, what are other thought leaders in your discipline doing that successful? What are other social science professors doing at different universities? Um, take a look, see what's working well for them and how you can adapt it to your own Twitter presence. And be a real person. Um, we don't wanna just see a ton of research and a ton of numbers. Um, we want to humanize that research and those numbers and that data um, so that people can also relate to you. And again, we'll get into that in just a second here. So real quick, we're gonna meet Twitter. Cute little bird here. Thank you, Andrea. So you're gonna need to learn to be concise, 280 characters or less, unless we're talking about a tweet thread and I can go in, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Stay active. So that's the most important part of Twitter. Twitter isn't just something that you can go on, post something, and then come back six months later when you have more research. You have to invest time. You have to become part of the community. Um, so I like to say, just for example, a full plan is one to two posts a day, five days a week. A post can include a retweet. So that's when you're sharing someone else's tweet. Um, a light plan can be one post per day, three days a week. A post, again, can include a retweet. Um, but the idea here is just to stay active. So whether you're going to do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, uh, whatever those days are, make sure you dedicate an hour or so a day on those days to your Twitter account so that you can stay active. Um, collaborate. So you're going to want to tag organizations and publications and people who you're referencing that you want to get the attention of. You can always tag in your tweets UCSC Transform, which is the Institute of Social Transformations Twitter, or our Twitter at UCSC, and we will share all of your stuff to help amplify you. Um, engage. So you're going to want to utilize hashtags to join conversations. We're going to talk a little bit about that as we go on. Um, retweet, like, and reply to other posts, and talk to your audience through replying and messaging. So this isn't just a platform that you can post your stuff and kind of walk away. You are going to have to be part of a community with other colleagues and looking at what they're tweeting, liking their tweets, replying to their tweets, uh, uh, retweeting. If someone comments on your tweet, you're going to want to engage with that tweet somehow by liking or replying, especially as you're growing your Twitter presence. Um, engagement on the platform is very important. There might be a day where you have nothing to share, but you're just going to go into Twitter and engage that day. Um, and that, that's also uh, totally acceptable and a great way to grow your presence. Um, and then analyze and evolve. So this is the internet, which is awesome. And why I love working on the internet is because you can post something, see if it works and then duplicate it or delete it or just not ever do it again. Um, so you're gonna wanna take a look and see how certain tweets do, how certain content does. Um, and then you can kind of take those insights and move forward on what your audience is really uh, responding to uh, rather than just guessing. And again, we'll talk about that in a minute here. Um, so I'm just going to really break down the anatomy of a Twitter profile real quick with one of our professors, Camila Hawthorne, one of our favorite tweeple here. Um, you're going to want to have a clear high-res photo as your profile photo. Hers is this awesome illustration, but you can have a headshot um, or anything else, but a real nice looking, um, not grainy or pixelated uh, photo for your profile photo. Uh, this is called the, uh, this is a high-res photo that represents your work or area of study in the background. Um, so, you know, some people have, you know, I've done this with a lot of scientists, like the Genomics Institute. So a lot of people have like beakers or other things that, you know, represents what they're doing. Um, Camila here has another really great illustration, but it's totally on brand for what she studies and what she does. And it totally makes sense. Header photo is the word I was looking for there. Um, and then you're going to want to fill out a little bio. It's about one to two sentences. Who are you and what do you do? Really simple. Um, if there is a hashtag you want to put in there, you can because it is searchable. Um, so if your research is all to do with racism in America and you want to make sure that people who are searching hashtag Black Lives Matter find your profile, you could put that in your um, in your in, in your uh, right here and people would be able to find it. Sorry, someone's not muted and I got distracted. Uh, this is a your website, so you're going to want to put a link to your research or website in here. Um, pretty simple. 
and just break down a little bit in anatomy of a tweet. Here's Catherine Sito Seto. Uh, you're gonna wanna have an authentic tone. Uh, love her tone here. Excited to share our new paper in science advances on illegal fishing in North Korean waters and the very human consequences. Super simple, um, relatable, exciting. She tagged relevant organizations. Uh, she's tagging her collaborators here. And she has the link, link to the article with the link preview. Um, so having a great photo or video or GIF um, or image or graph or something that relates uh, to your research when you're, when you're talking about it is super important and not just having a link that kind of trails on with nothing below it. Um, you wanna think about your tweet being in this constant rotation of news, this constant news feed that's just going. Uh, so anything that causes somebody to stop and take a look and read and then engage or click is super important. Um, so a couple of best practices here. You really wanna be an informer and not a me former. Uh, so an informer, uh, you share updates that are information-based and a me former shares information about themselves. So an informer has more than two times uh, the followers of me formers and sharing information on social media is better for your follower count than sharing information about yourself. So when you're informing people about your research, uh, it does a lot better than informing people about yourself. Um, unless you're, you know, some sort of a social media influencer or Kardashian or something, they seem to have figured that part out. Um, varied content. So what is your audience interested in? We want to make sure that we're posting uh, different types of content, different photos, different videos, different things that, that relate to what you're doing and not just uh, the same type of content over and over again, because uh, people will get bored. Uh, you want to be active so you want to publish on a consistent basis and respond to people kind of like what we talked about a couple slides back there uh, shortening your urls so when you have a url to your research you can go to something like bit.ly which is bit.ly it's a website and it shortens your your link for you uh, it helps with the character count and you can also get analytics on those links to see how many people have clicked on it um, and using hashtags wherever appropriate. This is just a hot tip. If you are sharing something about COVID, if you do COVID-19, only the COVID will link in the hashtag, not the dash. So you just wanna make it all COVID-19. Um, we're gonna talk about hashtags in a little bit, um, how to not over hashtag and just how to use those hashtags whenever it's appropriate. So once you get your page started, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is think about building your community. Who are you gonna follow? Who are you gonna engage with? Um, what is your uh, initial community gonna look like? So first you're gonna to wanna to find your people. So things you wanna think about, who are the thought leaders, change makers, activists, and policy makers in your field that you want to interact with and that you want to see your research and your work? And what are the publications and journalists that cover uh, the research in your areas? You're gonna wanna make sure you follow those people and publications. Um, are there any foundations that you wanna attract the attention of? Uh, make sure you're following those. Uh, what are the influential institutes and organizations in your field? And then once you've followed all of those people and figured out who that is, you can go ahead and data, data mine through uh, those people's follow lists and find other people that you're gonna wanna add. Um, since these people have similar interests and are in similar work field as you, there are going to be a lot of uh, kind of cross, cross followers that will probably work for you as well. And it's a great way to get ideas of who to follow as well. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about, so you wanna discover your academic micro communities. So there are many academic micro communities on Twitter. These are just a few of them. Um, a micro community is a small community that when they all talk to each other, they use the same hashtag. So actually academic Twitter is a pretty big one. Um, people use hashtag academic Twitter to talk about different things that they're doing in their field. And it kind of covers the gamut of all sorts of um, academic things. Um, but you know, we can even get granular with sock side Twitter or poli side Twitter. Um, my favorite is academics with cats, very fun. You don't have to join that if you don't need to. Um, but finding these relevant uh, micro communities is a really great way to start building your presence on Twitter um, and getting uh, active and getting new followers in these very niche areas that completely relate to what you're doing and finding your so-called tweeple. You can also connect with social justice movements on Twitter. Um, these are some of the uh, enduring hashtags that are that are kind of always going on. Um, you can follow these hashtags, use these hashtags when it relates to your research or when you are supporting these organizations. Um, so there's again plenty more out there. 
Um, so utilizing lists. So there is a feature on Twitter called Twitter lists um, that will curate uh, people and in interest. Um, so what you can do is you can start a new list that is, for example, climate experts. And within that list, you will put uh, different uh, handles of climate experts or different hashtags. And then once you click onto climate experts, the only thing in that feed will be uh, the people that you have designated that are climate experts the, and, and the hashtags. Um, so you will have an entire feed that's just dedicated to climate experts. And you can do that for anything. Um, so lists are super important in order to stay right in the niche of what's going on. So you don't have to dig through the huge field. Uh, I'm sorry, the huge news feed of, of what's happening. So how to use hashtags, the million dollar question. The way that I like to describe hashtags is it's like a virtual water cooler. So there's a lot of people that really over hashtag, um, but you really only wanna use one to two relevant hashtags for people to be able to see what you're talking about. So let's say I was really into the Game of Thrones finale. I would tweet something about, man, that Game of Thrones finale was awesome. Hashtag Game of Thrones. And then I'm automatically in the Game of Thrones conversation, that virtual water cooler um, about Game of Thrones. So things like hashtag water, things that are very general, you know, um, hashtag ocean, you know, hashtag fish. Those are not conversations that people are having um, around the water cooler, but hashtag climate change is something that people are having around the water cooler. Um, so you gotta think of it that way. Um, so you can use your hashtags around micro communities and movements. Um, when you have research or relevant topic to larger conversation, like we talked about climate change, COVID, social justice, Black Lives Matter, you should make sure that you're using those hashtags. Um, when you're participating in an event, super important. I know they're all virtual for now, but any sort of virtual conferences or virtual events um, that are using hashtags right now, um, make sure that, you know, I'm in the climate change conference at USC, really awesome talk from whoever, hashtag USC climate conference or you know whatever it was. Um, that way you're in the conversation of that, you'll find other people in the conversation that were at that event, you can follow them, they can follow you um, and there's just more engagement there. Um, and then there's also some like of the moment hashtags which will show up in your trending section. And these just happen every once in a while. Like for example, there was a hashtag actual living scientist, which was just profiles of scientists um, and what they were doing. Um, really casual, really fun, but it trended that day. So if you see stuff like that, you can also use hashtags to contribute to things like that as well, just to get uh, more impressions and get yourself in the, in the feed of those things with your colleagues. Here's how not to hashtag. My hashtag research on hashtag Monterey Bay, hashtag, uh, hashtag otter, hashtag population proves that hashtag climate change is real. The only hashtag that I would use in this is climate change. So real quick, a note on language. Um, you're really gonna wanna loosen it up. Be clear and concise. Think about who your audience is. What's the most exciting part of your research or program? You're gonna wanna highlight that. Visualize and humanize your research and our expertise. You're gonna really wanna tell a story about that. Don't over hashtag. That's, I, that's kind of my number one role as you're starting to learn. Um, if you wanna change the world, we have to know what you're talking about. Um, so you're really gonna to wanna to take uh, kind of the layman's version of, of your research uh, and really spell it out so that the most peaceful possible can, uh, can see what you're talking about. All right, so a couple examples here from some of your colleagues. Elizabeth Wrigley Field, which I researched, yes, is her real last name, Wrigley Field, pretty amazing. A sociologist over at the University of Minnesota. She told her research story here with a tweet thread, uh, which is where you can add different tweets to one thread so you get more than that 280 characters. But she does it in a way uh, that really expertly builds a story through her tweet thread about her research and she's highlighting headlines and data and she's building on emotions to get a user to elicit a click on her research paper. So I asked how many whites would have to die of COVID through all direct and indirect pathways for white mortality in 2020 to rise to the best level that black mortality has ever been. The answer, 400,000, great opening. Um, and then she kind of goes on here to talk a little bit more about the research, tells this story. Uh, just for time's sake, I'm just kind of going to go through it here. Um, and then at the end, you know, my article concludes this. A really expert way to tell your research and, and, and a story here about what it is. Um, using your expertise to join the com global conversation. 
So Erica Turner over at the over at UW Madison. Um, so a big topic right now, obviously during the pandemic, is pod schooling and schooling in general and how that's going to work. So she made an equity guide to pandemic schooling. It wasn't an official research paper that she did. It wasn't published. She made it on Google Drive. Um, lots of concern about wealthy families deepening educational inequities through pod schooling, but I haven't seen much about what families can do to make schooling more equitable. So I wrote this guide um, and she published the guide. Uh, obviously you can see here, it has gotten a lot of uh, traction. Um, so again, if you see something uh, that is you know, useful to your research and that is trending and you wanna join that global conversation, you don't necessarily have to have, you know, real research around it uh, or, or research in general around it. You can just kind of make, she kind of just made this thing and put it out into the world and she joined the global conversation, which is really great. Uh, here is using your expertise to join the conversation, a Twitter thread here from Bianca Baldridge from again, UW Madison. Uh, she's using her expertise here to comment again on pods and homeschooling during the pandemic. And this is just another great example, like you don't need to link a research paper to relate to current events. You can also just comment using your own expertise. And she makes a really great Twitter thread about that here. Uh, this is one of my favorites. This is Andre Gillespie over at Emory University. Uh, this is a great example of humanizing research in academia. So she composed this tweet here that goes off, goes on to show off her expertise, but she tied it into a current event and something completely relatable, which is political exasperation. So you can be a real person while still informing the public on your knowledge. I was trying to work today, but a reporter called to let me know that Cory Booker was trending on Twitter because Trump was throwing shade. As a scholar of deracialization, I now have to weigh in, even though I'd rather be grading something right now. And she goes into a whole tweet thread uh, using her expertise to weigh in on something like that. Um, you can comment on your peers' research. Here's a really great example that cites Rob Fairley's research. Uh, and then we have here, as you can see, the Verdant group. The recovery process will still take cooperation from people of all colors and skill sets. This is a plan going forward. And then they kind of share their plan as well. Um, so if there is a uh, nice way to to comment on other people's research, again, sharing your own research as kind of a collaborative effort, that's another really, really great way uh, to get in front of people. Um, and then also building community, super simple, but celebrating your peers and their work. Uh, here we have Stephanie over here from the Assistant Dean of Global Health Sciences at UC San Diego, um, doing a shout out to women in STEM. Um, this was from our friend, Ms. Wrigley Field um, and other people, um, even if you don't know, uh, these researchers or people in general, um, but you want to shout out their work and tag them um, because you really liked their research um, or what they were sharing. Um, it's a really great way to build community and to make those connections on Twitter. Here's some socks I tweeple that are doing it right. Uh, most of the people are referenced in, in the uh, presentation here, but you can surely go back and take a look at that. Um, so that is a very quick intro on how to use Twitter. Um, I'm going to pass it over now to Andrea to talk about how to connect with influencers. All right, so last year I was lucky enough to go to a UC conference where they connected us with a panel of journalists and influencers who directly told us what is the best way to reach out um, and get your work and or research covered by us. So. Obviously, they are all um, journalists are people, right? So they're all going to be a little bit different. But here are some general tips that they gave to follow. So um, they want you basically not to have cold calls with them. Um, they want you to be engaging with them, have an ongoing relationship with them so that when you want something, you're not a stranger, but that they've seen you interacting with them on social media. They prefer email or direct messages on Twitter rather than adding them in a tweet or tagging them into a tweet. Um, they get tagged hundreds of times a day. Um, so they want more of that direct communication with you. Otherwise, they'll miss that tweet that you want them to see. And like I said, they're more likely to respond to you if they've seen your name before. 
Um, so they want you to be engaging with them on social media. They also want authentic pitches. So they don't want to think that you are um, sending this mass email to five other journalists. They want to think that they're the only person who is uh, going to get your story or your research. And they do follow hashtags for story ideas. So make sure you are using them. Do your research on the hashtag. What is the best hashtag to use? What's the micro community that, um, that those publications and your area of work kind of overlap in? So do your research on hashtags. Don't just assume climate change is the best hashtag to get noticed, but maybe it's climate change 2020 or um, Fridays for Future. Um, so kind of really do your research and try to find that micro community that's most appropriate for your work. And influencers. So those are slightly different than journalists, but, um, but very similar in a lot of the ways of how to connect with them on Twitter. So again, they don't want cold calls. They want you to give them an email or direct message. Um, humanize, so engage with them on a personal account. So some of you might have access to your centers or um, organizations and have a brand, like a, a, a Twitter that's representing a brand, for example, Institute um, for Social Transformation. They don't want the Institute for Social Transformation to reach out to them. They want Andrea Lemus to reach out to them. So use your personal Twitter account to build that human relationship with them. And the briefer, the better. They don't have a ton of time. They're getting a lot of pitches. Um, go right to the, to the point. And show that you know their audience and know their previous work. You can mention, um, hey, I love that article that you did on the Me Too movement. I think that my research could also be relevant to your audience. So flattery. Um, show them that you know that you're following them. And storytelling. So show them the emotion behind the research. So one of the journalists brought up um, the fact that, you know, there was some cancer research, breaking cancer research, and she had heard about it, but she wasn't really interested in covering it. Um, but then she got a pitch that said, this is why the researcher chose to study cancer and had this whole backstory that emotionally connected the research and why it's important and why the researcher um, chose to devote their life to this. And then she, she chose to choose the, to pick up the story. And give them a hashtag to follow. So, you know, they might not be interested right now in picking up the research, but if you provide them with more of a customizable or um, micro community hashtag that you will be using to continually show your research on Twitter. Um, you know, for example, for our all in conference for the Institute for Social Transformation, we're using hashtag knowledge for justice. So I would let the influencer know, you know, if you want to find out more or follow along with our story, follow the hashtag knowledge for justice and, um, you know, stay connected so that maybe they're not interested now in covering the story, but the more that they're exposed to it, the greater the story becomes to them. And clearly spell out how your research applies to their movement or issue. So this is kind of connecting the flattery part, know, uh, showing them that you know their audience, you know their movement, and this is how you can insert yourself into that conversation. And ask for what you want. So if you would like a retweet, ask for a retweet. If you would like a paper or an article written, suggest that. Um, don't demand it, but let them know what you're here for and, and you know, what the connection is you would like to see. So let's talk about social justice action on social media. So what is social media activism? It is a form of protest or advocacy that uses social media channels. So we're seeing this a ton in our current events. Um, and social media activism can include promoting awareness of a movement, 
showing solidarity through hashtags and content sharing, um, or asking audiences for action, donations, measurable commitments to the change or the cause. And social media activism is really a massive show of scale through a shared hashtag usually that proves that an issue needs actionable change. And this is often inserted, you know, for um, the Breonna Taylor example. Uh, a large portion of the United States feels that more action needs to be taken. And this is not being covered on the, the mainstream media. So they are showing uh, the world that action needs to be changed because of all this massive support. And that support is mostly coming through social media right now. So an example of social media activism is the Me Too movement that I'm sure most of you are very familiar with, but let's talk about the history and the results, what came from this movement. Oops, excuse me. So this actually started in 2006 with Tarana Burke featured uh, in the left-hand photo. And she coined the phrase Me Too as a survivor of sexual assault. She wanted uh, to help women and girls of color who had also survived this. So she created this, this uh, nomenclature to talk about and to um, help people connect and share their stories. And in 2017, actress uh, Alyssa Milano reignited the Me Too movement with this tweet featured here. And um, it says, and this was right after Harvey Weinstein first uh, had allegations taken against him. And she says, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write me too as a reply to this tweet. Uh, suggested by a friend, if all the women who have been sexually harassed or assaulted wrote me too as a status, we might give people a sense of the magnitude of the problem. And this movement in both the 20, 2006 example and the 2017 example um, was empowerment through empathy. Survivors of sexual assault can bring awareness to this anti-sexual harassment movement via a shared language of hashtag me too. And what were the results of this? Unity by volume. Over half a million people tweeted me too in 24 hours and shared their story together on Twitter. And this eventually inspired millions of posts on Twitter. Multi-millions of posts on Twitter um, are associated with the hashtag MeToo movement. MeToo is now the slogan of the anti-sexual harassment movement. It has brought legal action against high profile men in entertainment and politics. And the MeToo movement continues to build over three years later. And this created policy changes. So since the Me Too movement began, more than a dozen states have adopted new laws on harassment and abuse. And this is really noted in part, uh, if not fully, because of the awareness that uh, this woman's movement created on Twitter. And it really just brought this problem that was always there to light asking people to, to create actionable change. So 10 states have expanded requirements for harassment training and prevention, and four states have extended the amount of time employees have to file harassment claims. And so this is just a great example that shows that emotional, strong emotional connection that you're trying to create on social media in order to get your research or your movements heard. Um, it really shows that human connection and the relatable content. Everyone wants, may, maybe not everyone, a lot of people want to share their story and this is giving them an outlet to do so and an area to connect with others who have a shared story with them. So the impact of social media movements, let's just talk about how we can get involved. You know, not every movement will be as huge as Me Too, but some things to, to take note of is um, that they always are surrounded 
by a hashtag. So that really becomes the lifeblood of an organizing of organizing a social movement. Um, you need to have this hashtag that people can tune into to get all of the information related to that topic. Um, hashtags play a central role in mobilizing the movements. Hashtags and viral tweets can give people a front row seat to a social movement. So users can get a minute to minute update of protests or an event, and it can be the best way to spread information to those on the ground. Twitter accounts can update feeds much faster than news networks and not and often news networks aren't covering these topics. So Twitter is really the channel and the outlet um, to get this news and this information out to a large audience. Um, they can't rely on news networks to pick up the story. And then um, call to action. So petitions and action demands are spread through hashtags as well. So make sure if you have actionable items that you put that into the movement on social media as well. So moving on to social media for social good. So Twitter is more than just for cat videos. Um, why do organizations use Twitter to spread their message? There's often a greater purpose for utilizing this platform. So people want to do good and they're kind of taking over social media from what it was to, create, to make it an impactful channel that can change the world. Social media has the ability to harness influencers in order to do good for society and to facilitate grassroots efforts. It's really a low cost, cost channel um, for most movements. A lot of movements do hire um, creative agencies uh, to utilize these channels, but you know, beyond that, Twitter is free, social media is free, and it's a really great platform to get your movement out there. You can gain global attention, so your, your contributors do not have to be local to participate in your movement. And you can connect with audiences and organizations that have similar missions, interests, and goals. So again, just reaching beyond your immediate community and finding that community um, you know, across the country or across the world and building that partnership to make your movement even stronger. And you can grow your causes quicker and better on social media. Okay, so social media for social good example uh, is a, the water is life example. And this happened a few years ago. And the goal was to bring clean water to Haiti. The strategy was to take over a popular hashtag, which is hashtag first world problems and change the conversation and generate don donations for for Haitians and clean water. So uh, what they did was taking created tweets, so cre tweets that were already living on Twitter created by other people and were hashtag first world problems. And they had Haitians read these and kind of show, the, show uh, the first world that their problems were really minimal and encourage them to donate to, um, to Haiti or to other uh, less fortunate countries to make change. So let's watch what they did. I hit when my phone charger won't reach my bed. I hit when my little seats aren't heated. When I go to the bathroom and I forget my phone. Let me the radio no machine a la via, you come and see something. I hate it when my house is so big. I need two wireless waters. When my makeup makes my hot water taste too cold. When I have to write my maid a check, but I forget her last night. I'm going to write a message to my mom. I'm going to write a message to my mom. I'm going to write a I hate it when I tell them no pickles, and they still give me pickles.
Okay, so many things made this an excellent campaign, but some things to note that Kayla and I have been bringing up throughout this whole presentation is that emotional connection. Um, concise, this, this was 60 seconds. It didn't ask a lot of the viewers and a call to action. So you're, you're presenting them with the problem, but you also need to ask them how you want them to participate. So the result of this was tons of money was raised. Waters Life was able to take that money and drill six new wells in, in Northern Haiti, gave out thousands of water filters and installed a water treatment plant providing over a million days of clean water to Haiti. So that I, I wanna be transparent. This was uh, created by a creative agency. Um, so this was not a uh, you know, organic grassroots kind of campaign from Water is Life, but they did uh, hire and spend money to create this awesome campaign, but the results were amazing. Um, also, hashtag first world problems survived this takeover. So they, Water is Life, inserted themselves onto this hashtag. Um, but it still exists today. So they didn't completely change the conversation. It was able to go on and function in the, the meme life that, that it was created for. So just some general impactful tips on how you can take your movement and make it successful is to just remember why should your audience care? Let's create that emotional connection for them. Tell a story, bring your, bring your issue to life for them. Provide a call to action. What do you want them to do? Is it sign petitions, donate their time or resources, call the represent, representatives? Um, you need to really spell out what it is you want them to do. And be human, honest, and transparent. So that is the best type of connection that we can make with people, even through social media. And plan for good and bad responses. So when you anticipate that your content might go viral, it's always a great idea to have some language prepared for reactions. Um, and you don't want a canned response, which means every time someone asks you a question, you provide them with the same exact language, but you do want general language that you can then work around and um, have it be authentic with each answer. Um, and basically just keep in mind that if you start a social media movement, you need to have thick skin. You will get trolls. You will get lots of people with opposite views that try to discredit you or discredit your movement and just prepare for that mentally and um, tac uh, tactically. <laughs> um, yes, so this is, this is in line with creating a communication strategy is anticipating how an audience might respond to you.